I'm a scuba diver. I've been diving for a little over 10 years, 11 years now. Uh, and since I uh, became a scuba diver, um, obviously the oceans have really come into focus for me. Um, and a few years after beginning my diving career, um, my wife and I really started to notice the decline in shark populations and, and really have, were driven to find out why. Why was this happening? Why were we taking trips where um, before us people had gone and seen literally hundreds of sharks and when we went there we would see no sharks? Um, it really perplexed us and we, so we were driven to find out why and that's what brought us to Shark Savers. Shark Savers is an organization that was started by a group of six divers. Uh, the, the home office is in uh, New York City. Uh, it's grown to um, a worldwide organization now. There is a very large chapter in West Palm Beach, Florida. And there's, uh, there are uh, chapters in England, in Germany, and a huge and very important chapter in, uh, in Asia, in Singapore, Hong Kong. And I'll tell you a little bit about them because the work that that chapter is doing is groundbreaking and just amazing, uh, amazing stuff. Uh, just a quick note about who you're seeing on the, on the, uh, the screen here. Um, this is one of our favorite sharks. This is Emma. Emma is a now 15-foot uh, tiger shark in the Bahamas, and we were fortunate enough to meet Emma the year before last on a trip down there. Uh, Emma is the most photographed fish in the world. So uh, shark savers, uh, our goals are to motivate people to stop eating shark fin soup. We'll talk a little about, about what that is and why that's important. Uh, to promote, promote shark-friendly communities and marinas, and to empower divers and indeed the public to become more aware about shark conservation, what the issues are, and, and to learn what it is they can do to help stop the decline in shark populations worldwide. Tens of millions of sharks are killed every year. The largest uh, reason for the decline in shark populations are for their fins. There are other reasons for shark uh, population declines. Uh, they are taken as bycatch. Bycatch is when you're targeting one fish, such as a tuna or a swordfish, and uh, you, you have thousands of lines in the water, and they end up pulling up all kinds of other things besides what it is you're trying to catch. Turtles, dolphins, sharks. So if you're trying to catch a bunch of short, a swordfish, that might be 50% of what you pull up on your lines. The rest of it is bycatch, or things that you are, that that fishing interest is not really uh, going to try to make money off of, but they pull it up anyway. So a lot of sharks, especially in the swordfish and tuna fishing industries, are taken as bycatch. Um, the problem with the loss in, in shark populations, and the numbers are, the numbers depending on, on which source you go to are very widely. One number that was thrown out pretty widely for a while was 100 million sharks. The number is really as many as 73 million sharks per year are killed from a number of different sources. That's uh, for, for the shark fin trade, bycatch, targeted shark fishing for, for sport fishing. Um, the problem with that is that sharks can't withstand that pressure. The reason for that is it takes them as an apex predator. Sharks are at the top of the food chain in their ecosystems. They're apex predators. It takes them a very long time to reach reproductive age or sexual maturity. And when they do reproduce, they have very uh, small numbers of, of young. So what happens is, at, let's say um, a tuna, a yellowfin, or something like that, they can spawn as many, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of eggs, but sharks will have six pups. So the, the smaller fish can reproduce their numbers much easier than sharks can. You can't have a population of, of, of apex predators that are targeted that heavily because they can't sustain that, uh, that pressure. If you take uh, a million sharks out of the ecosystem, the ones that are left are only going to reproduce 50,000. So they can't, the more you take each year, just keeps, uh, keeps reducing those local populations. So the number of sharks that are left in our oceans now, um, you can see by year, in 1996, there were 15 shark species that were listed as threatened or endangered by the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. That's the organization that defines the red list that, uh, that declares populations of animals either uh, threatened with extinction or endangered. So in 1996, there were 15 shark species. In 2000, there were 19. All of a sudden, there was a huge boom. Now in 2004, 82 species of sharks are listed as threatened. 114 in 2007, 
2008, 126. I believe that number is, is over 150 now. There are over 400 species of sharks in our oceans, and we are affecting fully more than 25% of those populations with our fishing exploitation. Some of those shark species, uh, the large pelagic sharks, oceanic white tips, we see some beautiful photographs um, of oceanic white tips, um, hammerhead sharks, scout hammerhead sharks, uh, silky sharks have been targeted to the level that there are less than 10% of the populations of, of those sharks left in the wild that were there from 20 years ago. Scout hammerhead sharks have been depleted 99%. We have 1% of scallop hammerhead sharks left in our oceans now. Interesting fact for you. Everybody in the room, is everybody, who in this room believes that tigers are, are in threat, being threatened with extinction in the water? Who believes that? Right? There's a little interesting fact for you. There are fewer great white sharks left in our oceans than there are tigers left in the, the uh, jungles of Asia. And if that number doesn't scare you, it should because we can count the number of tigers and we have to go by anecdote to, to measure the number of great whites. So for that number to become a reality is, is very, very scary. So why are, the, are shark populations in the wild declining? Shark fin soup. Yeah. This is the overwhelming reason for the decline of shark populations in the wild. Shark fin soup is a Chinese Asian delicacy, mainly in China, some other uh, cultures embrace it as well, but mainly Chinese. It was uh, uh, part of the, the dynasties, the emperors, only the very wealthy and, and the ruling class in China could afford shark fin soup. Emperors, uh, after the end of the dynasties, the ruling class were very, very wealthy in China. They were the only people that could afford shark fin soup. It's very, very uh, class oriented. In the 1980s, there was a huge economic boom in China that is continuing today. What that did was create a new upper class, um, increase the numbers of upper class and upper middle class Chinese citizens who could now afford shark fin soup and began consuming it. It was originally uh, meant for very special occasions, weddings, Chinese New Year, very, very important banquets. But now because of it's, it's a status symbol. It's kind of like owning a Rolls Royce. I am wealthy enough now to where I can afford to serve shark fin soup at my important events. So because of that, it became, it's, it's become more and more prevalent for uh, classes in China, in China to consume it. So around 1980, if you look at the, at the uh, export, import, export numbers of shark fin, you see, you know, you see a certain number coming, going along, then all of a sudden in 1980, Boom, it starts to escalate. And that's right about when the Chinese economic boom happened. There's a huge spike in, in the year 2000. You know why? Millennial New Year. So there's a huge spike in the year 2000 of serving shark fin soup. This is by far the main reason for shark population declines um, in our waters. Probably 90% of sharks that are killed are killed for shark fin soup. Um, so why should we why should we be concerned that I should also mention um, shark fin soup has also driven a practice called shark finning. Not all sharks die because of shark finning. Uh, we need to be clear about that. They they do land sharks whole. But what shark finning is, if you imagine a fisherman who's out there on the ocean, uh, he's trying to bring back as much sellable product as he can to port. He's trying to maximize his profits. So. And that's based on the amount of weight his boat can carry. Well, if he brings up 100 sharks on his, his boat, he's pretty much full look, fully loaded. But the shark fin is really the, the, the highly prized value of the shark. It's worth 100 times more than the rest of the shark. Shark meat is not valued as a product in the rest of the world or anywhere, really. So what do they do? They cut the fins off the shark. They shark, throw the shark back in the water, and they just take the fins back because that's it's like having gold for that fish. That's where, the, that's where the money is. So it's driven this practice of shark finning, where they cut the fins off the shark, and while the shark's still alive, they throw it back in the water. Because they really, you know, they're done with the shark at that point. And the shark either bleeds to death or drowns. And this can take not just a matter of hours, but for sharks, they can be found a day later still alive. So it's, it's really a horrible, horrible practice. A friend of ours, uh, Jim Abernethy, runs an operation in Florida, and has said, if we did these kind of things on land that we're doing in the ocean, it would never happen. because we wouldn't allow it. But because it's in the ocean, nobody sees it. And 
And so that's why it happens. So why should we be concerned about the fate of sharks anyway? Okay, sharks are evil, right? They kill people, they eat all the fish that we want. So if we get rid of all the sharks, that's more fish for us, right? No. <laughs> um, sharks are very important to our marine ecosystems. They keep the oceans in healthy balance. Um, you have to think of the ecosystem as a pyramid, and sharks are at the top of that pyramid. It's called a, it's called the local ecosystem in balance. And if you remove sharks from, from that local ecosystem, what's going to happen is the next animal underneath the sharks, their populations, explode. Then they decimate the population next down the chain, and so on and so forth. You get explosion, decimation, explosion, decimation. We have documented cases where removal of sharks from local ecosystems have wiped out coral reefs because what happens is the sharks eat the larger fish in that area. Those fish explode in population. They eat the smaller fish, which keep the algae off the corals. So that population grows. They kill off all the fish that keep the algae under control. Now the coral reef overgrows an algae and dies. So you just killed your entire local ecosystem just by killing off one species one target animal for a minuscule amount of profit. Okay? On the eastern seaboard of the United States, classic case off the New Jersey coast, there was a 100-year-old scallop fishery. Um, in the early late 80s, late 80s early 90s, uh, fishing interests in that area wiped out the local shark populations. The cow-nosed rays in that area exploded in population and killed off all the scallops. So what happened is those fishermen just destroyed a 100-year-old scallop fishery for a profit uh, that lasted them, it lasted about maybe five years. So they really destroyed their own interests in that area. Um, sharks help maintain valuable fish stocks. One other uh, purpose that apex predators serve is they weed out the unhealthy, the weak, the, uh, the sick, the, the already dead sharks are kind of like the garbage eaters. Sharks would rather eat, um, sharks are opportunistic. They'd rather eat off of a dead whale than try and, and kill a live tuna. It's just easier for them. They won't get hurt. So they, they, they eat the dead animals first, the unhealthy, and that's like wolves in the wild. They'll kill off the, uh, the, the sick or the weak deer in the forest. The population of deer that remain are the healthy ones, the ones that are most likely to maintain a healthy deer population. That's what sharks do in the ocean. So the idea that, hey, if we remove all the sharks, then we'll have more healthy fish populations is completely wrong. Because without sharks, to kill off the, the sick and the weak, diseases will spread more. Uh, genetic... Uh, uh, mutations. Thank you. Yeah, genetic mutations will, will uh, increase. And so the populations of those fish won't be healthy anymore. It can actually can impact that population where it can go extinct. So they're very important to keeping our, our ecosystems in balance. A lot of people, um, there's also this perception, this is one thing that Shark Savers works really hard, is there's this perception of sharks as these evil man killing machines. Um, again, this is Emma, uh, one of our, our favorite sharks in Tiger Beach, uh, Bahamas. Um, I've been in the water with Emma, spent a whole day in the water with her, and another um, probably 12 foot uh, tiger shark by the name of Pauline. And I've never felt threatened once. In fact, I've probably never been as calm underwater as I was that entire day. Simply because they're just swimming around us. Emma loves to be photographed. Uh, she's, Jim calls her her super mom. Because she, she'll swim right in front of you, swim around you. Now, I'm not trying to give you the perception that they're like puppy dogs. Because they are apex predators. They, you know, given the opportunity, they could do great damage. But humans are not on sharks. We just aren't. And I can prove that right now because when you go in the water in the California, off the California coast, there are great white sharks right here off our coast. And the fact that in the 20th century, there were only eight deaths due to shark attack all along the Pacific coast of North America, eight people in an entire century. If sharks, if we were on their, on their menu, sharks would be waiting at the beach for us to step foot in the water so they could grab us. Because we are such easy prey. We are so clumsy in the water and so easy. It would, it's, it would just be a, a, a smorgasbord for them. So why does it happen more often? Because we aren't on the menu. When sharks attack in California, what happens is it will be a bite and release. Because once they bite a human, they realize, oh, this is terrible. What is this? And they spit it out and they're done. Now, in an 
16 foot bright shark bites you, that can be kind of a bad thing. But it's a testament to the fact that more, there are not more deaths because of that. It's a testament to that. It's just an investigation. It's not a full on, you know, air jaws come out of the water attack. It's just an investigation. They don't know what we are. They, have, they don't see us that often. So it's an investigation. So the, the idea that sharks are these, these dangerous, man-eating um, animals is, is really a misperception. And really, they're very valuable to local tourism. Um, shark, shark encounters are the most sought-after dive uh, destination right now. One shark could be worth $500,000 to a million dollars over its lifetime, as opposed to about $150 landed on a fishing boat. So if you're, a, if you're somebody in, somebody in a, uh, a local area that has a lot of sharks, you can bring divers in they, to see the sharks, swim with them, because trust me, people like myself and my friends, we pay, we want to see sharks, we want to dive in the water with them. So it's worth a lot more to those people to keep those sharks alive over their lifetime. You can kill a shark once, but you can bring tourism dollars year after year after year for people who want to come in and see them. <clears throat> The other thing about sharks is you really don't want to eat shark. Because they're at the top of the food chain, all the, all the toxins that humans have dumped in the oceans for thousands of years has filtered up to them. Yeah, exactly. So sharks are very high content in methylmercury and BMAA, and don't ask me to, to say that word because I can't. Uh, but BMAA is a neurotoxin that's been linked to, linked to Alzheimer's and ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So sharks are very, very unhealthy to eat. The level of mercury in them is just, you don't want to eat shark. If, yeah, if you went to serve me shark, I had a saw it go Right? So they're very, and, and then uh, part of the, uh, the tradition, part of the, part of the thing about shark fin soup is, you know, you're, you're consuming an apex predator, so it makes you strong and virile, and, and yeah, exactly the opposite. It's going to make you sterile and um, and have neuro uh, neurological diseases. It's, it's not it's not good. Uh, another problem that we've seen um, a close relative of sharks are rays. These are manta rays that um, have been fished, um, and this is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, we're partnering with Wild Aid on the manta ray of hope. And this is being driven largely by the shark fin trade. Um, as uh, as they fish out sharks, far, um, it's being more becoming more difficult for them to fish sharks out of the ocean. Why? Because they're killing them all off. Nine, remember, scalloped hammerheads, 99% killed off. Oceanic white tips, 90% killed off. So they're turning to targeting manta and mobula rays. And what they're targeting for are their gill raiders. Manta rays and mobulates are filter feeders. They filter water over their gills, and these gills have rakers in them that pull the plankton and, and small animals out of the water so that they can eat them. So they take the mantis and modulus, they cut the gill rakers out, dry them, dry them like they would shark fins, and put them in a soup or a tonic. Okay? This is becoming, you know, becoming a huge, huge problem, and I'll talk a little bit more about this project. But even more so than sharks, mantis, and modulus reach sexual maturity even later in life than sharks do. Where sharks might have six to ten pups in a litter, mantas will typically have one or two. Sharks can reproduce anywhere from one to three years. Three years is the short period for mantas and mobulas. I mean, only once every three years, and they only have one. So this is so unsustainable, it's ridiculous. And a manta ray, this is one of the highest diving tourism draws in the world for people to come see manta rays. So for these, these communities, we're trying to make them understand that stop this unsustainable practice and, and try and, and reverse this because this is very, very dangerous. So what can we as people here do to save sharks? Shark Savers has a number of programs to attack a couple of different directions, both the demand side and the supply side. Our I'm Finished with Fins program is where we're trying to get people who, who uh, are part of the Asian community to stop consuming shark fin soup. If we can stop the demand for shark fin soup all the way, this problem would go away. If we could stop people from eating shark, shark fin soup, period, we wouldn't be having this discussion, okay? But also on the supply side, a couple of ways. Um, our shark sanctuary program, we've been working with governments worldwide to create marine protected areas 
where sharks are not targeted, where it's illegal to fish for sharks. Create areas where they can um, have a sanctuary and reproduce, uh, not be targeted by fishermen. Also, um, strong laws uh, uh, in, in banning shark fin or shark products. Um, right now, the, the entire west coast of the United States, uh, it is now illegal to possess, sell, or trade shark fins. We're very proud to be able to say that, say that. It started in Hawaii in 2010, and in 2011, Oregon, Washington, and California passed laws making it illegal to possess, sell, or trade shark fins. That did two things. It stopped, uh, amazingly enough, you can, you can still go to San Francisco, downtown LA, go to a Chinatown and still get shark fin soup in the United States. It's amazing. Well, what this has done is stop that demand here in the United States, at least along the western uh, uh, seaboard. But also, you can't traffic shark fins through California anymore. You can't bring them in from Central America, bring them to our large ports, and then traffic them over to Asia. It's made it more difficult for the shark fin trade to traffic those fins through the United States and get them to their destination in Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, China. So, um, Actually, so the shark fin here, ban here in California went into effect last year. You can still, you'll still see it in some restaurants because they've been allowed, if they had a stock of shark fin there, they're allowed to sell it off until they're done. But as of January last year, they could not import any more shark fin into California. Um, Chicago, um, Illinois passed it last year. We're trying to work with uh, the Eastern Seaboard now, New York, New Jersey. Um, and to be honest with you, that's gonna be a tough fight, amazingly enough, because um, the Eastern Seaboard in the United States has a very strong and very um, uh, anchored in fishing trade, and sharks are part of that. Um, not just for uh, fins is a small part of that, but um, there, there, there is a demand for sharks um, on the Eastern Seaboard in the United States, and that's, that's going to be a tough fight. We're, we're gearing it up again this year. So, uh, uh, and also the Gulf of Mexico, Texas. Uh, we're working on Texas as well. Uh, so shark, uh, shark sanctuaries and trade bans. These are some areas um, where we work with governments of the world to enact uh, shark sanctuaries. Here's your Congo, Maldives is extremely important. Raja Ampat, the Bahamas. When we were doing the, the shark fin ban here in California, when we were working towards that, one of the days we were in Sacramento, they announced, the Bahamas announced that the entire country is a shark sanctuary. You can no longer fish for sharks in the Bahamas, which is a huge deal. It's, it was really, really rewarding to see that. Uh, Marianas Islands, Micronesia, to see these areas in Asia like Raja Ampat and Marianas and Micronesia, French Polynesia, starting to, to realize the value of sharks and realize what's happening, it's, it's a huge step forward. So this is, this is really, uh, really important. Um, Green Parks, uh, Galapagos Island, Cocos Island, which is part of uh, Costa Rica, very large shark populations. It's important to, uh, to, to maintain those. Um, enforcement is another discussion. <laughs> um, support for the shark fin trade ban is growing rapidly. I can tell you in the last year, the, uh, the public opinion, uh, the, the perception of shark fin in Asia has changed immensely. And this is where I wanted to talk about the Shark Savers Singapore and Hong Kong group. They have done some amazing things to shift perception over there. Um, there are very large hotel and market chains that are saying we are no longer going to carry shark fin products. We are no longer going to allow people to serve shark fin at our company events. Um, if you're on a trip for this company, you cannot expense shark fin as part of your business expenses. If you think you need to serve shark fin to business associates as part of a dinner or whatever, we're not going to expense that. There's been a huge perception shift in Asia. The government of China announced that they are, are considering, they haven't enacted it, but for them to announce publicly that they are considering not allowing shark fin soup at government public events, I cannot express to you how huge a shift in perception that is. So um, a lot of great work. Uh, Yao Ming has uh, been working with Wild Egg. Uh, we worked on a, uh, on a partnership with Wild Egg where there were some public service announcements uh, that were made with Yao Ming. He's a huge star in China, huge. Anybody not know who he is? He was a center for the Houston Rockets. He's a huge, huge, he's retired now, but hugely respected in China. 
And so he did, uh, there were billboards at bus stops, airports, uh, train stations in Beijing, uh, <coughs> Guangzhou province, Beijing. Shanghai. Thank you. Yeah, Shanghai. Man, I'm glad I got you here to remind me stuff. <laughs> so yeah, um, and it was a huge, 80, they did a survey, 80% of the people who saw those ads said they were thinking differently about shark fin soup. 80% of people who saw that campaign had a, had a shift in their perception of shark fin soup. In that part of the world, education is important. The problem is education takes a long time to happen, and we don't have that time. 1% of hammerhead sharks are left, scalloped hammerheads. We don't have the time to educate everybody in Asia. To, to get that perception. We have to, we have to take other means by the bans and stopping the trade. Um, there's some more examples of, of hotels. Shark fins gets off the menu at Peninsula Hotels. Um, NTUC, fair price, pulls shark fins off its um, Shangri-La, joins the fight against it. I mean, it's almost weekly now, a large organization is coming out, taking a stand. And also, um, I forget the name of, I, I apologize, I forget the name of the group, but he is actually, this uh, hotel chain, the executive is doing shark awareness presentations for his employees and asking them to talk to their families and bring their families to these presentations to learn why he's made this choice of not of, of banning shark fin at his company um, events and, and so on. Not just to ban it within his business, but to educate his, his employees and their families' wives to spread that message out. Just, and this is the Shark Savers uh, Singapore Hong Kong group. I cannot say enough good things about them. China billionaire lawmaker urges leg legislation against shark fin trade. This, the Shanghai Daily, okay, this is a Chinese newspaper, okay? For, for that uh, perception to shift has been just a wonderful thing. Uh, so Shark Savers also has uh, other public awareness programs, not just on the legislative side, but what I'm doing here, coming out to the public and talking, informing people. Um, you know, there, I still meet people on a regular basis. Shark fin, what? Is it, what? Sharks are bad, right? And so that there's still a lot of work to be done in the, in the public perception area. This group, this was actually in Sacramento um, on one of the, uh, the lobby days we had up there. There's also a new program called Sharks Count, which is a really important uh, pro new program for shark savers, where we're asking recreational divers, just everyday people who, who dive for fun, if you're out on a recreational dive and you see a shark, write it down. How many were there? What type was it? And, and where was it? What was it doing? And tell us about it. Uh, we have data sheets that they can record this and tell us regularly about shark populations because the IUCN that I mentioned before, a lot of their information about species of sharks, besides the ones that are, are apparent, you know, are obviously endangered, there are over 400 species of sharks. If you look through the IUCN database, what do they say? Data deficient, data deficient, data deficient. In other words, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. So if we, who's in the water more than recreational scuba divers? So with them giving us information, we can supplement that data because there just aren't enough marine biologists out there. There just aren't enough to get the amount, the massive amount of data that we need to document these populations. Uh, so that's a great program, and I like to give this example. Here along the California coast, blue sharks used to be a regular thing to see. You, if you did a day of diving at Catalina, chances were you were going to see a blue shark sometime during that day. People going across the channel on the, on the ferry would see blue sharks just in the channel. They're gone. There are no more blue sharks off California. We've been on a trip, shot them all day. I'm dumping blood and fish oil in the water all day and saw two sharks. Back in the early you know, 1975, we would have had a point fifty. So sharks have been removed. If recreational divers had been taking that data during that period when that was happening, we could have done something about it. We could have said something to DFNG or to NOAA or somebody to say, guys, the sharks are disappearing. We need to do something. So it's really important that we, we engage the public, the people who are out there who, who actually have a chance of getting this kind of data for us. And I, again, I mentioned the manta ray of hope. This is a really difficult one because this is really only prevalent in, in Asia, and it's really prevalent in, in develop, the developing parts of that, uh, that uh, right. part of the world. So we're trying to get, uh, we're trying to work with those nations which, um, that are bringing the manta products in trying to get them to realize that it's unsustainable 
and that they're going to run out of product in literally five to ten years. They're going to wipe them out. So uh, we're trying to work with governments to um, address you know, sanctuaries for mantas and modulas, um, stop the demand, and uh, just create this awareness of that this is happening. The other uh, pro um, program we have going on in Asia is I'm finished with fins. And this is where people can take a pledge and, and make a public statement that, hey, um, I'm vowing not to eat shark fin uh, soup or, or uh, traffic shark, uh, shark products anymore. And this is a, this is a pretty big program in, uh, in Asia. Uh, the other thing you can do, choose shark-friendly seafood. Remember I mentioned bycatch, where if you eat uh, you know, bluefin tuna, chances are to get that piece of bluefin tuna on your plate, you, they probably killed you know, 100 sharks for that one tuna, right? So the amount of bycatch, the amount of bycatch for shrimp, to bring 100 pounds of shrimp on the boat takes 1,000 pounds of catch, okay? Shrimp is, is horrible in terms of bycatch, okay? Don't, don't eat shrimp, don't eat bluefin tuna. Bluefin tuna, by the way, is almost extinct in the Atlantic. We're working on the last 5% of that population. You see bluefin tuna on a menu, avoid that. It's really bad. Um, also, very high in bycatch storage. So, I highly recommend you go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium website, download their seafood watch card. It's very simple. It has uh, green, yellow, and red uh, for seafood choices. Red is swordfish, tuna, shark. Um, and just avoid eating those kinds. Make smart seafood choices, seafood that is sustainable. And give sharks a chance. Support laws that protect them, uh, restrict it, and restrict the, the trade in shark skins. And tell people what I've told you today, that, that sharks aren't the enemy, that, that we need sharks. We, you know, I'm not asking you to love sharks the way I do. You don't have to. That's OK. Um, but at least don't hate them to the, to, the, to the point that we want to kill them, because that's not good for us. Um, I, I always like to make a quote from uh, Captain Paul Watson from the Sea Shepherds, a really simple quote. The oceans die, we die. And it's that simple. If we did decimate the oceans, we're next. Um, you, can, uh, you can join Shark Savers. Um, if you'd like to do some volunteer work, contact me. Uh, I'll help get you in engagements in some of our events. Educate your community. Sign petitions that you see on Facebook or somewhere that, that protect sharks. If you're a scuba diver, get, down, get out there and go dive with sharks and manta rays and learn more about them. You don't have to get in the water with a 14-foot tiger shark. You, you know, go dive with some Caribbean gray reef sharks. They're, I've, they're, they're great fun to dive with. Dive with manta rays. Um, donate to either Shark Savers or another shark conservation organization. Help us, help us do this fight worldwide. So thank you for your time. Um, sharks are friends. This is a beautiful whale shark. And um, by the way, they are also targeted for their fins. It doesn't matter what kind of shark it is.